uh, had to do with you know, reorganization of the cytoskeleton and acting contractility, but not formal one lipodia. So this is a very, very specific mechanism, intracellular mechanism. And it is a little bit paradoxical if you think about it, that contraction of the cytoskeletal machinery inside the cells allows the tissue to relax. Isn't that a little funny? It, it is a little paradoxical, right? But that's, what it, that's what's happening. The cell, by contracting, is able to expand and relax the tissue. <coughs> so we think it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Now, if you look at, remember at the beginning of the talk, I was talking about loose and dense connective tissues. So one of the things we were wondering is, well, is this response of the tissue, this sort of tension regulation essentially, occur in all types of connective tissues? Or just so far, the only tissues that I've showed you, all the experiments I've showed you so far, have been about loose connective tissue. But if you look in dense connective tissue, such as the actual fascia matrix around the, around the muscles, this does not occur. See, here's the fibroblast in non-stretched versus stretched. Dense connective tissue, they look the same. Whereas in the loose, this is non-stretched and stretched, the fibroblast expand here. So, it means that in the dense matrix, somehow, either the fibroblasts are not feeling the force, or they're not responding to the force, but somehow they're not responding. So we wondered for a while, is it because we just got the wrong force? Maybe you need to use a different amount of force, you know, in the dense connective tissue. So one of my technicians spent a lot of time trying all kinds of different forces. And so she tried everything she, you know, from very low to very high, and blue is the dense, and you see nothing. Here's the cross-sectional area of the cell, so in the red is where the cells are expanding in response in the areolar, loose connective tissue in response to the force, but in the dense connective tissue, she was never able to make them respond. So it looks like in the dense connective tissue, what's going on is the matrix of, is probably too tight, and it shields the cells from the force. It takes the load. So the cells don't feel the, probably the strain deformation enough to be able to respond. So why would that be important? Well, what happens when you get injured? Okay. So I was talking about earlier saying one of the very important components of the loose connective tissue is it, it sits in between the fascia layers. It, it allows the dense layers. Here you see the two. This is a mouse uh, abdominal wall. And you see here the two layers of dense connective tissue are in blue, and they're separated by this white stuff. That you can't quite see too well, but it's the white stuff is the stuff that, because these are fixed histological sections, so it just kind of disappears. But it's the loose connective tissue that allows the dense layer to move past one another, to glide, okay? So when you get injured, this is a mouse injury model that we have. Not only do the dense connective tissue layers down here get thicker, but they fuse. Okay, the loose connective tissue now has become dense, okay, and it's essentially creating a scar. And so the, the dense connective tissue is now spanning the two layers. There's no longer mobility between the layers. So the idea is, well, what happens now to this nice areolar connective tissue tension regulation? Is it gone? Possibly. So maybe in, in injured areolar connective tissue, you do not get this tissue tension regulations. And what could be the consequences of that? So as I'm going to say, talk about at the end, um, we're, right now we're really looking into that. So just in summary, I think we, it's important to think of the connective tissue as a fabric, okay, that extends throughout the whole body. But this fabric has a varying weave. You have some areas that are tight and some areas that are loose. And you, the body is constantly remodeling its connective tissue, going you know, in more in the, towards the tight direction or going towards the loose direction, depending on, you know, is it injured, is it healthy, what kind of activity it is. If you're a weightlifter, right, if you're lifting weights, your connective tissue needs to be stronger in order to be withstand, withstand its load. But increase in strength and density is, is that it goes at a price you know, of increased stiffness, but also possibly easing, decreased responsiveness, right, of the fibroblasts. Now, in the loose direction, there's more compliance, more mobility, more responsiveness, but less strength. So you have to write, obviously, the connective tissue is trying to establish the correct balance, right, for itself throughout this whole network in, in trying to find, you know, we want strength, but we also want flexibility. We want both. We want to somehow be at the ideal location 
at all different parts of the body has to be harmonious with that uh, taken into consideration. Now, what are the other important things? Well, these, this connective tissue matrix is not just connective tissue, right? It has things in it. It has inhabitants. The inhabitants of connective tissue are blood vessels, right? Sensory nerves. There's a lot of sensory nerves and motor nerves, obviously, too, but that run through the connective tissue. And also a lot of immune cells, right? Macrophages, mast cells, all kinds of things. But, so it's likely that these blood vessels and sensory nerves are affected by what's going on around them. Right? We know this, that they're very sensitive to mechanical forces. But one of the questions that we've wondered also is, well, we know that sensory nerves run through connective tissue, but is connective tissue actually innervated? <coughs> Do they end in connective tissue and transmit sensation from the connective tissue? Funny enough, one of my graduate students started working on this some years ago, and she reviewed, reviewed the literature. She found very little evidence in the literature that there's actual sensory nerve endings that terminate in connective tissue. She saw some silver stains kind of way back in the old literature. She saw some more recent immunohistochemical representations of what appeared to be what people were saying were sensory nerve endings. But 100% of what she found so far was in cut tissue sections that where uh, people had done, you know, histological sections of 5 or 10 microns. So how do you know that something, if you see something that looks like an ending, that it wasn't just simply a cut end? You know, you don't really know. So she kind of embarked on this project where you can dim the lights all the way for this one. So she's see this. Um, this. She used something called confocal microscopy. And this is a f microscope that allows you to take optical sections through the tissues without actually cutting it physically, okay? And what she looked for were sensory nerve endings inside the tissue, which she stained with uh, CGRP, which is a marker of sensory, for sensory nerves. And she looked whether, this is a collagen matrix around the nerve, and she looked through the, all the confocal slices where there was collagen both above and below and all the way around uh, the, uh, the sensory nerve. So you see here in this case there's collagen and then all of a sudden you start seeing the little sensory nerve and then it disappears here at the end and the same thing and I'm sure you can't see that all that well. But the, the, the main idea was that in some of these slices in the middle of the section you'll see as it's represented here the little sensory nerve and this is a projection, an orthogonal projection so you see all of the collagen all the way around it. So this really is terminating. That's the punchline. <laughs> So, um, so, but that wasn't good enough because, you know, it's not just good enough. You have to really be able to quantify how many of these sections. Do you see only one or two? I mean, that wouldn't be too exciting. You want to know how many. So you can put the lights a little bit back up if you want. Um, and so she did an experiment where she injected a tracer into the connective tissue of the mouse here in the back at the level of L3. And then she followed this retrograde tracer back to the dorsal ganglion. And she was able to then count the number of uh, DRG cells that the cell bodies that picked up the tracer. And the important thing about this tracer is called fast blue. It's only taken up at the sensory nerve ending. It's not taken up if the sensory nerve is simply just passing through. Okay. And then she counted uh, the number of cells that co-localized that had both the fast blue staining and the CGRP, which meant that they were sensory. Okay. So um, what she found is that uh, on average, about 75% of the cells were co-localized that, that had fast blue, also had CGRP. Okay, what that means is it was a pretty uh, important sensory percentage of, of, of the cells were, were sensory. And also, it's a very interesting thing. There was a rostral shift in where she found the peak of the fast blue tracing at about L1. And so, but she injected the tracer at L3. And this is interesting because um, in the literature, whoops, oh, what happened? I must have skipped the slide, I'm sorry. No? Okay, I'm sorry. I skipped this. I, uh, once I got the lead, but I'm just going to tell you what it is. There was a, an electrophysiological study by uh, a group called uh, by, uh, Tabushi in Japan where they did electrophysiological recordings of, uh, by pinching the fascia of the muscle, and they found the same thing. 
they, they were recording from the dorsal root, uh, from the dorsal horn, excuse me, of the spinal cord. And they found the same rostral shift of two uh, levels up, which was very much like what my student found. And the other thing that they found is that the electrophysiological recording was increased very much so, and the receptive fields of these neurons was very much increased when uh, there was inflammation in the muscle. But what was mostly increased was the cells that responded to stimulation of the fascia overlying the muscle, not the muscle itself. Okay? So the cells in, in the connective tissue <coughs> appear to be responsive to mechanical stimulation, responsive to the presence of inflammation, and they do send sensory afferent uh, signals. So connective tissue appears to be innervated. Now, if you compare the innervation of the connective tissue, like that 75% percentage that she found compared to other, uh, other um, uh, in the literature, people have looked in the same way using the same CGRP and fast blue staining of the knee joint. And again, they found about 75% of the fast blue staining uh, cells co express CGRP. As opposed to skin, where it's only 35%, and trapezius muscle, 32%. So I guess what that means is that the innervation of the connective tissue appears to be significant um, in, in terms of, you know, compared with other places. So what happens when there's inflammation? So what we wondered is, well, um, what, is there a way that we can induce specific inflammation specifically in that connective tissue compartment that wouldn't spill over, you know, into the skin or the muscles? So, what my student did is that she, the same way she injected the fast flu, she injected a substance called carrageenan, which is an, an inflammatory agent that causes persistent inflammation for several weeks. And you can see she injected the carrageenan here between the dermis and the muscle, and it stays right there. And she can also pick it up with ultrasound here. This is the, the little carrageenan. There's the skin, subcutaneous tissue here, perimuscular fascia, and the muscle. So you see the inflammation is in that compartment. And then she, she decided, well, let's see if stretching the animal, like we had done, you know, at the, for the, to induce the fibroblast response, uh, would, would affect the amount of inflammation that's in this tissue. So she did the, the rats were stretched for 10 minutes, twice a day, for two weeks. And the stretch is quite interesting. She developed this method where she holds the rat by the tail, and the rat spontaneously grabs the edge of the table and stretches, and they're very happy to, to hold that position <laughs> for 10 minutes. It's amazing. They, they, it's like they go into a trance, and she talks to them while they do this, and they actually engage in this position. They, 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 you see how they extend their back feet? And they're really stretching. I mean, it's beautiful to watch them. And it's really quite remarkable. They, they don't ever complain or sleep. Or they, you know, they, they're really, they like doing it. And so the sham intervention here, she simply holds them by the tail. The animal spends the same amount of time uh, out of the cage, and, uh, but they don't stretch. Okay? And so her question was, could that have an effect on the amount of inflammation that's in the tissue? The first thing she noticed that this, the animals that had, so all these animals had had carrageenan. Well, some of them had had uh, vehicle, you know, saline injected instead of carrageenan. But she noticed that animals that had the inflammation had a bit of a waddly gait. She decided to measure that. So she measured that by putting finger paint under the uh, feet of the mouse and of the rat and having them walk on a paper. And then she measured the stride length. And uh, so here are the vehicle injected animals. You can see that there's no difference between stretch and no stretch. Here are the carrageenan animals, okay, that have not been stretched. These have inflammation. Their stride length is quite reduced. Here are the sham animals that are basically the same. And look at the stretch animals. They're normal. They're essentially, their gait went back to normal after being stretched. She also looked at the intra-step distance, which is the diagonal here between one back foot and the other back foot. Same pattern, okay, normal here and abnormal here. She also looked at, she did von Frey filament testing to look at mechanical sensitivity right at the, at the spot where she injected the carrageenan on the back. And uh, she, so here the vehicle, an increased response means more pain sensitivity, okay. So here's the carabinin, here's the sham, and then here's the stretch. So the, the mechanical sensitivity is reduced, and in the uh, it's almost normal in the animals that have been stretched. So they are.